Okay. Well, good morning, everyone, uh, or afternoon, depending on what part of the community you're in. Uh, my name is Emily Yeiser Sepp. I'm the director of the Farm Animal Care Program this morning. Um, we are going to be having a webinar uh, on cattle marketing. And this is a webinar that is jointly done between Merck Animal Health and National Milk Producers Federation. Our two organizations formed a partnership over a year ago to help ensure a comprehensive, industry-wide approach to employee training and animal care in the dairy industry. Through the partnership, uh, dairy producers across the country have access to tools, resources, and workshops available through the Merck Animal Health Dairy Care Initiative, an extension of the Dairy Care 365 Animal Handling Training Program. This webinar series further builds upon the strong partnership that has been forged in support of the significant efforts of dairy producers to continuously improve the care and handling of their animals. This is one of 10 webinars that has uh, started to cover various aspects of animal care topics, which are designed to help dairy farmers meet our new requirements of Farm Version 3.0. The live webinars will also be recorded and hosted on the farm website for viewing later, along with the Merck Animal Health Dairy Care 365 Animal Handling Video Training Modules. The Dairy Care Initiative was designed to complement the farm program and helps producers meet farm requirements, including the creation of a cow care agreement, developing written standard operating procedures, and providing employee training. The Dairy Care Initiative was developed to help dairy farmers provide the best animal care by maintaining sound policies, hiring the right people, and making sure that they are properly trained. Since its creation, over 50 workshops have been held in 23 states to help dairy farmers and their veterinarians tailor the dairy care materials for their farms. The Dairy Care Initiative includes comprehensive resource guides, Dairy Care 365 animal handling video training modules in both English and Spanish, customizable templates for animal care policies and standard operating procedures, and free workshops for farm owners herdsmen, managers, supervisors, and veterinarians. It's my pleasure today to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Lowell Midla. Dr. Lowell Midla received his bachelor's degree from the University of Pennsylvania in 1988 and his VMD, uh, Doctor of Veterinary Medicine, also from the University of Pennsylvania in 1992. Following graduation, Dr. Midla joined a mixed animal practice in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. In 1994, he moved to The Ohio State University, where he completed a food animal medicine and surgery residency and simultaneously earned a master's degree. His master's degree research focused on laminitis and lameness in dairy cattle. In 1996, Dr. Midla and his wife, Joanne, established a veterinary practice near Mariana, Pennsylvania. In the fall of 2001, he then joined the faculty of The Ohio State University practicing and teaching at the Large Animal Ambulatory Service in Marysville, Ohio. In 2016, he joined the Cattle Technical Services team at Merck Animal Health. Dr. Middle was appointed by the American Association of Bovine Practitioners to serve on the Council for Agricultural Tech Science and Technology Board of Representatives, from which he was elected to serve as a CAST president in 2013. Dr. Midla practiced dairy medicine privately uh, earlier in his career, and we're pleased to have him with us today. So without further uh, delay, we will turn this over to Dr. Midla. Good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Lowell Midla, and I appreciate that fine introduction. I'm going to click this to full screen for me, and we are going to get started. So uh, I believe, you know, obviously sort of de facto, uh, because you're on this call, you already care about your, your cows and, 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 and uh, what happens to them when they leave the farm. I want to spend just a moment to, to perhaps motivate you a bit further. And then we're going to run through several do's and don'ts of cattle marketing. So just a, a, a quick note, we're talking today about animals that are sort of making a career change, right? Animals that are, that are, that are going to, to be harvested. 
we're not really talking about animals that are sold to another dairyman to continue their their dairy career. Uh, I think you, you you folks already know those con uh, those considerations regarding those animals, and that's to communicate openly and honestly with the buyer to avoid any any confusion or complaints in the future. So we're talking about animals that are destined for beef. So why should we care? And, and reason number one uh, is, is adequate, right? Because we all want to do the right thing. Doing the right thing is the right thing to do. If you're perhaps not adequately motivated by that, then I would I would submit politely that consumers give us the, the license to operate, right? If folks don't buy our product, which is milk, uh, we are not going to continue in, in, in business. And it's public perception of the entire industry not just milk, not just uh, our cows and how we handle them, but also um, uh, how we handle them when they're when they're on their way to be harvested. You know, if that animal that animal is black and white, uh, not to not to uh, not to diminish the importance of our, our our wonderful Jersey producers and other color breeds, but but uh, if that animal is black and white, it's considered a dairy cow, and uh, we need to handle and make sure that, that those animals are handled properly at all stages of their career. And just if nothing else, in order to preserve the, the opportunity to, to make and sell, produce and sell milk. So I would encourage you to read chapter 10 in the, in the Farm 3.0 manual. It's only three pages. Most of this presentation comes directly from chapter 10 as well as chapter 8, which is only about two and a half pages. Um, so, so you'll you'll get most of what I'm going to say today in those two champ chapters, and it's a very small investment of time to just just sit down and read them. It's 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 not they're not that long. But having said that, I would encourage you to not just follow the guidelines, but 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 more to embrace the the guidelines. Um, you know, it's kind of uh, similar to following the letter of the law, and then following the spirit of the law. If we all follow the spirit of the law, not to suggest that, that what's in the farm manual is laws, but if we follow the, the, the spirit of the guidelines, then, then we can ensure that we're doing the right thing for our, for our cows and for the industry and, and, and uh, for ourselves. So regarding uh, fitness of the animal to be marketed, uh, it's a farm 3.0 requirement that we have written in protocols that specify age, uh, product route, route of administration to ensure food safety, uh, follow proper meat and uh, milk and meat residue with, with hold times, um, as well as definitions of what cattle are eligible to be marketed. So let me let me read that again, drilling down on on something that I think is important. It's it is a Farm 3.0 requirement that we have written protocols that define which cattle are eligible to be marketed. So, you know, I, 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 I have, right along with you as a veterinarian, uh, been involved in the situation where, darn, today is Tuesday and sale day was yesterday. This cow is going to have to wait six more days to go to the sale. And honestly, that should never really come into play, right? If the cow is not going to be able to make it six days, She's not. She's not uh, a, a, an appropriate cow to be harvested. Uh, so we should not market cows that can't get up. We all know that they won't. They won't take them at the, at the harvest plant or the auction barn anyway. Um, but it just makes sense that we shouldn't market cows that can't get up. Uh, but likewise, we should not market cows that are at risk of becoming non-ambulatory during during the trip uh, to the har to harvest and time at the harvest plant. We should not market cows that are at, are at risk of calving. We should not market cows that have any injury to the spine or any fractured limb or other fracture. Uh, those cows, uh, and I would encourage you to consult with your veterinarian regarding those cows and what know uh, their their suitability uh, to for food um, but but it would be okay on those cows potentially uh, to perform on farm slaughter if that's if that's an option in your area um, and finally we should not market cows that have any condition that might cause them to fail uh, slaughter inspection and we're going to talk about those so what are those conditions that might cause a cow 
the not pass inspection. Um, and that, that slash in that first bullet point is a bit mis misleading. I apologize for that. That should be interpreted as an or, not an and. So any cow with cancer eye in, in, in even only one eye, um, so cancer eye is a condition that, that will cause them to fail. Uh, but if they are blind in both eyes for any reason, uh, they, will, they will not pass, not pass inspection. Uh, of course, a drug residue would rule them out uh, for, for, for food. Um, any fever, uh, and, and typically cows are, this is, I, that, to my, best of my knowledge, this isn't the hard and fast rule, uh, but if a cow has a temperature greater than 105, uh, oftentimes the inspector won't let them through. Peritonitis or infection in the abdomen. Unreduced prolapse, so prolapsed vagina, prolapsed uterus, prolapsed rectum, any unreduced prolapse at, when she gets to the auction barn or, or harvest facility will cause her to fail. Uh, distended udder, uh, obviously distended udder, udder causing pain will cause her to fail. Any visible open wound and finally evidence of a central nervous system or, or brain or spinal cord abnormality. Uh, will will cause that cause that cow to fail fail inspection. So those are the things that cause them to fail inspection. Uh, what might cause the inspector to look a little closer? Look a little closer for the things mentioned in the previous slide. Uh, so e evidence of a recent surgery. Uh, so that cow is just post DA. Even even toggle sutures if they're hang, hanging down uh, will cause the inspector to look a little more closely evidence of recent treatment for disease, even just injection site swellings, uh, but particularly evidence of recent uh, IV injections, uh, lameness, and body condition score less than two. Um, and it, that will, body condition score less than two will come up again uh, because really we shouldn't be transporting, even transporting cows that are less than DCS2. And I would, I would point out that um, you know, cows that are less than DCS2 are, are, are very thin cows, right? Uh, potentially a cow might be a 1.75 and, and be just fine, and you'll know those cows. Uh, but broadly and generally, that's certainly going to cause the inspector to look a little closer, and broadly and generally, uh, those very thin cows shouldn't be transported. So again, it's a requirement that you have a written protocol for culling and transporting to slaughter dairy animals, and specifically that that be developed in consultation with your veterinarian. Um, this doesn't need to be complex. Doesn't need to be a long document. Just needs to outline your guidelines, and it's pretty easily buildable if you go to Appendix H of the Farm 3.0 guidelines. And of course, we, 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 we need to, to adhere to the withdrawal times for both milk and meat uh, and not have had any violations in the last three years in order to be up to date and, and uh, cool with, with the, the NMPF Farm 3.0 guidelines. So obviously, ensure that the animal is free from drug residue. Do that by following label directions, dose, route of administration, and withdrawal times. Certainly there are cases where we use drugs in an extra label manner, always done in consultation with a veterinarian. Uh, uh, and it should be remembered that when we do that, extended withdrawal times are always necessary. And again, work with your veterinarian to, uh, to, to, to figure out the appropriate withdrawal time for any particular extra label dose or, or route of administration. I would point out that, for example, uh, good old penicillin, which is still a very good and useful drug, uh, can have a very extended withdrawal time. For example, subcutaneous administration, particularly of large volumes in one site. So if you give you know, 40 cc's of penicillin sub-Q all in one site, that can lead to a withdrawal time of weeks to months more than more than months, just for just from one injection. Um, so keep in mind that those cows can stay hot for an extended time uh, with any extra label use, particularly penicillin. Uh, these animals should be segregated from other animals. Uh, obviously, keep we need to keep records, and I'll dive into that a little deeper here in a moment. Uh, there are drug residue screening tests on, uh, for example, on urine. 
that are available and are reasonably inexpensive. Um, generally, we shouldn't need to, to, to use them if we're, we're following label directions um, or have extended withdrawal times for an extra label drug, but at the same time, if there's any doubt, screen her first or do not market her. Then finally, uh, employees need not only to be trained, but I would encourage you to uh, make it a, a, a not only a policy, but, but perhaps uh, better stated, a culture on your farm that residue avoidance is something that's important to you. Right? It has to be uh, so that you can sell milk, but it should be important as well because it's the right thing to do uh, for both you and the future of the dairy industry and for the consumer of the meat. So this statement that I just made, of course we ensure that all, do, do, do to the best of our ability all that we can to ensure that animals that we market are free from drug residue. You know, that, that falls into the category of a nice thing for, for vet boy here to say, right? But how can we actually do that? What are, so I'll give you, a, give you two tips here. First, um, you know, just, just like when, when NASA is sending a rocket into space, they want to have redundant systems and fail-safe procedures. So I would encourage you to have a second check, right? Where just before the animal is loaded onto the truck, have it be the policy that somebody goes back to the to the uh, uh, where the records are kept to that one record and double check based on the ID of that cow, identification of that cow, uh, just before she gets on the truck that she is that cow, and you double check that that she's going to be free. You know, because sometimes an animal gets treated and, and it's just not fresh in your mind. A cow that might have been treated for pneumonia or, you know, she's not a fresh cow any longer, um, kind of slips your mind that she, she might have had a problem for which she was treated. And uh, it's, it's good to have that fail-safe double-check procedure just to be sure that there's no, that she hasn't been treated. And if she has, that she's, she's well past her withdrawal time for me. So. The record keeping requirement is permanent, easily accessible drug treatment records that are maintained and denote how all drugs were not only used, but also disposed. Uh, that's a requirement. So if you, you know, if a, uh, a, a bottle of uh, antibiotic or, 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 or otherwise goes out of date and you have to throw it away, uh, that needs to be recorded. So once again, nice thing for Vet Boy to say, maintain good records. But how do, we, uh, how do we avoid problems? I would encourage you to have a single treatment record repository. So if that cow was treated, it's going to be there. Um, and that can be you know, either computer-based or paper-based, but have one place where, that, where, where the, the person putting her on the truck can check that if she was treated, it will definitely be there. Certainly okay to have barn sheets, um, you know, for, the, for, for folks doing the treatment so they can record it right away or on your handheld. But then that needs to, the, the next action following those morning treatments or afternoon treatments needs to go, be to go back to that single database and uh, uh, make sure that, that it's recorded there as well immediately. And then, and then we know that that one single database is going to be up to date and complete. So, this first bullet is, is a little bit, I need to clarify it a little bit. Uh, it, 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 it reads, if you are using dairy comp, that records must be maintained for at least two years, and that, that's, that's not exactly correct. All records, so if there's a violation, FDA, and in, indeed, even if there's not a, a violation, the FDA requirement is that records be maintained for two years. That's what they want to see is a two-year uh, record-keeping requirement. Um, so, but if you are using dairy comp as your official record, I would recommend at minimum that you back up, back that up daily. And that can, there's several different ways to back it up, um, but make sure you have it back up. You know, if the computer explodes and you lose all your records, that's a problem. Um, and even better would be to have a daily record, a daily document, um, and, and really, this is kind of a requirement, you know, not only that, that the information be in that cow's cow file, but also a record of what was done on what day that includes animal identification, treatment date, of course, the drug, the dose, and the root of administration. All three of those are important. 
the specified withdrawal interval, um, which gets a little annoying to have to write each time, but it needs to be written, uh, as well as the date OK, uh, uh, the, 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 the slaughter withdrawal, withdrawal interval, as well as the milk withdrawal interval. And then finally, uh, it's an FDA requirement that the individual who administered the drug or the treatment um, uh, is recorded as well as was this recommended by a veterinarian. And even if you do all of these things, I'm not going to guarantee that uh, uh, the FDA is going to say that's okay. To the best of my knowledge, this is the requirement, um, and, and, and hopefully you will never, never get that, that dreaded letter. Uh, but you, should you get the dreaded letter and, uh, uh, and someone's headed out to the farm, um, it's going to depend a little bit on what they expect and their own personality and, and, and what they think the requirements are. Uh, but if you do these things, I would, I would suggest that, that that probably at least gets you pretty close. So um, we talked about conditions that warrant increased scrutiny for uh, regarding pre-slaughter pre, uh, pre inspection, conditions that will also, at harvest time, Warrant additional testing for drug residue are, of course, mastitis, evidence of metritis, evidence of pneumonia, uh, again, evidence of a recent surgery, uh, and even just an ankle band or any evidence of treatment for recent disease, again, an injection site swelling or evidence of IV injection, um, particularly in calves, but even in adult cows, if the uh, uh, GI tract contents are discolored, uh, that's suggestive of oral medication and, and such. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't guarantee that they're going to look for drug residues in that case. And of course, there's always random screening for drug residues. Um, but if they find any of these things, they are certainly more likely to single that cow out and, and check her. So there is an ID requirement. Um, and it, it is indeed that each animal be permanently identified at the auction barn or, or uh, uh, at harvest. And the official, officially acceptable forms, the key word here is permanent, permanent identification. The acceptable forms of permanent ID uh, certainly vary by state. There are, there are individual states with, with requirements. Um, uh, but the uh, uh, official, officially recognized generally by USDA are either 840 RFIDs, and an RFID, remember, is only official if it starts with the numbers 840. There are some, some legacy numbers that they used to use, 982, uh, et cetera. But I believe starting in 2015, uh, 840 will be the only official uh, tag moving forward, or the, or the good old sil silver metal tags. Now, one thing I would, I would note is um, that you probably ID'd that cow by her farm uh, ID tag uh, and may or may not have a record of that official ID. So I would suggest just, again, just make it a standard policy as the cow gets on the truck to record the actual number from her actual ear and not just rely on your records that the uh, uh, official, official tag that you have recorded in your, in your uh, records matches the tag in her ear, I would, I would double check that and make sure that you have a record of the actual tag in that cow's ear uh, as she heads off. Um, just because, you know, she might get flagged and, and then you have documentation that it turns out that's somebody else's cow, right? So we talked about fitness to be marketed, about fitness just simply to be transported. We should not transport cows, of course, again, that can't get up, non-ambulatory, or, or are at risk of becoming non-ambulatory. Uh, again, in the Farm 3.0 guidelines, uh, cattle that are less than body condition score 2 are at increased risk. Um, cows that are at risk of calving during transport, uh, cattle that are, have a spinal cord or other injury or a fracture, um, and finally, cows that are, you know, exhausted, dehydrated, we really should, should, should take a day to, to try to get that cow in better shape to, to make the trip before, before putting her on the truck. So how about 
uh, getting her on the truck and once she gets on the truck. You know, I realize that, uh, uh, that you're not going to see this cow again, so your, your level of concern for her uh, might decrease and your level of concern for how she's handled might decrease. Um, I would suggest politely that this cow is about to give you that last full measure of devotion, right? She's going to make a sacrifice, um, um, and she's, she's done well for you uh, up to now, and she's made you some milk income. Uh, now she's going to make you some meat in income. Let's treat her nicely on our way to do that. So the Form 3.0 requirement uh, is that documentation exists of training for all, that's both new and existing employees, with, resp with respect to several things, but that includes stockmanship, stockmanship being animal handling, at least on an annual basis. So let me repeat that, excerpting it. You need to have documentation of training for all employees with respect to animal handling at least annually. That's annual training, not annual documentation. Annual training with respect to annual handling. And I would, I would put a little plug in here for the Dairy Care Merck 365 videos on stockmanship training uh, are one way to achieve this. So the best practice is to uh, minimize stress when loading and unloading animals. So our animal caretakers need to be trained properly. Um, we need to design our, you know, oftentimes on dairy farms, um, some, some things sort of become an afterthought. We spend a lot of time designing the free stalls and the parlor. Um, and I, I've seen some, some odd locations and, and methods of loading cows in my day on, on many farms, but, you know, really, uh, and, and I realize that once a facility is in place, it's, it's hard to retrofit, um, but, but perhaps some, some investment there is, is a good idea. And then finally, it is, it is important to, uh, to the extent possible, minimize the number of direction changes along the way. So when we're loading, we should do that slowly, we should do it calmly, we should do it quietly, not only with our voices, but minimize other loud noises. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, t typically a cow that's on her way to harvest is, is, is not going to be producing a lot of milk, um, but at the same time to the extent possible, and it, it, if in fact she is producing a significant volume of milk, uh, try, to, try to milk that cow just before loading so she doesn't, doesn't wind up uh, uh, having a distended udder by the time she's harvested. Uh, and in fact, I'll, I'll remind you that uh, distended udder is a, a cause for increased scrutiny and, uh, regarding pre-slaughter in, in inspection. And I, I would also take just a brief moment to point out, I, I taught at Ohio State for 15 years, and, and I would have students through the ambulatory section that, you know, had, had spent very, very little, if any, time on a farm before, and we'd be out in, in, on a large dairy doing herd check with skid loaders whizzing by and, and cows moving past, and, and sometimes we'd, we'd engage with, uh, with, the, with the, the clients in, in helping to move cows, and, and my, my suggestion, suggestion to them was, if I, could, if I could tell you just one thing with respect to animal handling, it would be this. Um, that cows are, are somewhat like, like husbands. Uh, if you have the patience to allow them to decide on their own to do what you want them to do, uh, it is infinitely better than trying to force them to do what you want them to do. So again, uh, uh, you know, when getting on a truck, a, a dairy cow may not have seen a, a, a livestock trailer ever in her life and cattle are pr uh, prey animals, so they're wary of anything new. It's a threat. And so oftentimes we move those cows right up to the trailer and they jump right on. But oftentimes a, a cow will balk and want to stop and sniff, and, and it's because that's a new thing that she's never seen before. And just giving her a second to sniff, oftentimes then they'll say, oh, okay, not a threat, and they'll jump right on. But if we continue to force, 
they will increase their level of, of not wanting to go. So again, give the cow just a moment to allow to to allow her to decide on her own to do what you want her to do rather than trying to force her too quickly. So we really shouldn't be using cattle prods to move, in, in fact, I'll, let me start again. We should not ever be using cattle prods to routinely move cows. That's not what cattle prods are for. Um, if you choose to own a cattle prod, uh, I would encourage you to use it only in the rare instance when that cow, you know, you've spent several minutes, 10, 15 minutes, and the cow just absolutely will not move. Um, sometimes uh, it's, it's, it really it decreases the, you know, the, as she's standing there, there's some degree of stress. Maybe if she just goes ahead and jumps on, that'll have a net lower stress uh, by by, by just using the prod once. But if you choose to own one, I encourage you, you know, just like most likely on your operation, there's a limited number of people allowed to treat cows for mastitis in the parlor. I would also encourage you to limit the number of people with access uh, who, who are authorized to use the cattle prod. I would store it in a place where it's really kind of a pain in the neck to go get uh, so that people don't do it often. And once they've gone and gotten it, Use the rule of pick it up, use it, put it back down. Don't then continue to use it for the rest of the day. And really, this is this is not neither a do or don't of cattle marking. And this is more of a duh. If you just think about it, if you routinely have to use a loud voice or prodding or those sorts of things, that indicates an underlying facilities or personnel problem that really. Uh, requires your attention to make it so that you don't need to do those things. So, regarding transportation, uh, you should know your hauler. You should work with a hauler if you don't do it yourself that is going to treat your animals as you would and provide for their safety and comfort. Uh, you should request that that person sign an animal care agreement uh, that you can develop once again, most likely in conjunction with your veterinarian, that outlines your expectation for how you want them to treat your cows while they're in their care. Um, um, all transport crews should have a, at least a minimum understanding of behavior and, and how to move animals appropriately. And a great resource for, for building that is the Master Cattle Transporter Guide uh, that's available at the livestocknetwork.com website. So to the extent possible, you should, you know, and, and certainly if you're, if you're hauling them yourself, ensure that there's good footing on that trailer, at least a little bit of sawdust or, or other bedding on the floor uh, so that it's not slick. Uh, ventilation in summer um, and, and uh, uh, do what you can in the winter to, to make sure that they don't get too cold, particularly if it's a long journey. Um, and then we want to kind of do our best to if we have a cow that's, that's uh, maybe a little on the weak side, uh, try to uh, segregate her by herself um, and try to make sure that she's on the back of the trailer and take a moment to decide if, you know, she's, she really isn't so, so weak that, that she, she maybe should just be humanely euthanized on farm and, and maybe not make the trip. So don't overload the trailer, obviously. Um, and don't overlook the importance of an adequate amount of time to, to uh, take a break periodically and check on the cows. Um, I, I think it's unlikely that, that cattle would typically be being transported more than 12 to 24 hours uh, on their way to harvest. But if that happens to be the case for you and your operation, uh, then you do need to make uh, provisions for feed and water during the trip. and. And there are some state guidelines uh, uh, in addition that you may need to follow. So what about bull calves? And a lot of what I'm about to say is going to apply to all calves, not just male calves, but um, male calves kind of get the short end of the stick now and then, and, and we really need to uh, do our best that they are also not overlooked and are tre treated humanely. Um, so all calves on the farm, including male calves, should receive colostrum. It is the right thing to do. And indeed, it's a Farm 3.0 requirement. Um, but, but, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've been to, 
to tens if not hundreds of lectures from some veterinarian or some animal health expert talking about the value of colostrum and how important it is. It certainly is important, um, but it's also important in male calves. Everyone should get colostrum. And uh, cattle also, er, calves, again, including male calves, need to have an adequate quality and quantity of milk uh, to grow, grow, and, and, and until the time that they leave, their farm, leave the farm. So don't overlook the male calves. Um, the picture on the right, obviously, is, is a little bit of an exaggeration, but it's never, never too early to feed a calf colostrum. That ability to absorb colostrum does start to decline immediately after birth and declines pretty rapidly, so it's never too early. Well, perhaps this is a bit too early, but never too early to feed colostrum. And once again, all calves should receive colostrum. It's the right thing to do. And finally, all calves need access to clean water. Not everyone does this, and it's a Farm 3.0 requirement. The reason it's a Farm 3.0 requirement is, once again, because it's the right thing to do. All calves should have access to clean, clean water uh, to main, maintain hydration. Obviously, more important in the summer, um, but, but at all times. And just a, just a quick note, because I'm a veterinarian and I can't help it, uh, always mix, mix, mix the milk replacer according to the directions. Don't add a little more water uh, in summer thinking they need the water. All you're doing is, is starving them by diluting the milk replacer. Um, um, mix the milk replacer according to directions and then give them free choice water in addition. So uh, we need to follow these animal handling or stockmanship principles when working with calves as well. Uh, Treat them nicely, quietly, calm, controlled manner. Um, you do need a written protocol for this, that personnel are indeed properly trained in ha handling calves, at least at minimum those folks who are involved with handling calves. Um, and calves should be moved by walking, lifting, or carrying them. No other methods are acceptable. Um, now, I, I'll, I guess I'll put a little asterisk on that, carrying them to include uh, moving them in, in, you know, calf carts or other, other uh, transportation devices uh, designed for calves. Um, but, but we need to, we need to be mindful that we're, that uh, abusive behavior is never tolerated for animals of any age. So, in summary, I'm not going to read all these. I'll give you a moment to dwell on them. But we need to do the right thing for the consumer the industry and the cow. Maintain records, ensure uh, that uh, both milk and meat are, are free from drug residues, um, treat our animals humanely. We need to not market cows that, that shouldn't be marketed, and we should follow good stockmanship uh, principles when that, when that cow is, uh, as far as animal handling and getting her on the trailer when she's, when she's making the final trip away from the farm. So I alluded to this earlier, but uh, Merck Animal Health uh, has developed this Dairy Care 365 Animal Handling Video Training Series. If you Google uh, Merck Dairy Care 365, you can you can get to it. Uh, it does require a sign on the first first time, um, and and basically just requires you to to provide yourself a password. Uh, we're not going to we're not going to spam you with email or anything like that. It just just requires a password to get access to it. Available both in Spanish or English. Um, this is the list of videos that we have. Um, there is a new video that should be up and posted soon on biosecurity. And I just checked this morning, and it's not on the website quite yet. Excuse me, and there will be more videos to be added following that one. But the next one, at least to the best of my knowledge. To be added uh, involves biosecurity, and it should be up soon, probably, uh, I'm going to say February 1st. So with that, any questions, and I'll uh, hand it back over to Emily to take the controls. Great. Thanks, Dr. Mindla. Um, for those of you who have questions, we have, you should see a Q&A box in the bottom right-hand part of your screen or click at the top of your screen, there's also a question mark button for Q&A. So feel free to click on that um, 
for any questions that may have come up during the presentation. Don't be bashful. I'm sure I wasn't that good of a presenter that I made everything completely clear. <laughs> well, you, you've already gotten at least a compliment, Dr. Midla, so <laughs> that's, that's great. They um, appreciate and say thanks and a nice job. Um, from you. our standpoint, what, um, I guess, in working with, with the veterinary community as well as uh, our producer base, what are some recommendations um, to make sure that these messages uh, come across both, um, I guess, from all levels, from not just us as a farm program or you all as Merck, but in addition to the on-farm level. Put the password in. Oh, that probably just went to sleep. Yeah, so I think, uh, again, it's, it's, a, it's, it's less about following the rules uh, and more about creating a culture. And uh, with the leadership of the dairy operation, uh, the owner, the herdsman, um, but creating that culture that this is something that we care about. We care about our cows. You know, the, 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 I refer you to the, if you're not familiar with it, the w, WD Hoard statement of uh, cows are mothers and, and they de deserve to be treated as mothers. And, and, and it's not only because our income de depends on them, but, but it, it's because cows are moms and, and they deserve, deserve to be treated with respect. Um, not getting that quote exactly right. I'd encourage you to look it up, but it's a good one. Um, uh, and and create that culture on the farm that that encourages and fosters it, and lets lets the folks on that farm know that this is something that's not only important to you, but again important to maintain our our social license to continue to to sell milk. Okay, one um, one question has come in on the on the beef side of things. Um, from a BQA standpoint, um, how do you, or I guess from your experience and what you foresee in the future, um, how do you envision some of these things um, around both both traditional beef and dairy beef uh, becoming, I guess, changing or becoming more stringent uh, as as we move forward, not only. Um, you know, on the as the cows get onto the truck, um, but potentially once they get to either uh, an auction yard or or directly at the plant, have you seen uh, progressions and and any foreshadowing to what those types of um, rules and regulations may start to to look like? Yeah. So so. Um, uh... I don't it, the, the 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 rules and inspection that are in place right now uh, are really pretty stringent. I don't see that uh, progressing, although I don't have a crystal ball and it's, there certainly may be things coming down the pike of which I'm not aware, but uh, you know it, 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 again, it's it's the, uh, uh, the 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 spirit of the guidelines, not the letter of the guidelines. So let me give you an, an example. so, uh, we all know that injections should be given in the neck, right? Because uh, the neck is easier to trim, and it's the, the sort of the, the, the less expensive part of the part of the carcass. Um, uh, but but on dairy farms, oftentimes it's 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 difficult, right? If we're using a palpation rail, it's difficult to give injections in the neck. Even in headlocks, it's it's difficult and perhaps even a bit dangerous to the to the, the, the person giving the injection to either reach over the headlock or move between cows to give injections in the neck. Um, but just because something is hard doesn't diminish uh, the fact that it's the right thing to do. So it gets back to having a, um, uh, in, in, in making it easier, right? Making it more convenient via design of facilities to be able to give injections in the neck that's a that's a BQA one of the most fundamental BQA guidelines is that all injections should be given in the neck um, when possible and uh, so so it, it, I guess my answer to the question in summary is if 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 we did a better job of following the current recommendations um, I think that would go a long way toward toward uh, um, uh, 
making beef quality assurance just improve generally. Great, thank you. Um, another one that's coming, um, do you have any suggestions on how to best move cattle into a hoof trimming chute without the use of uh, the prods? Yeah, so that's a good one. Um, again, uh, given that cattle are prey animals, that hoof trimming chute is something that they see only very rarely, so it's kind of new every time they see it, right? Um, uh, having having appropriate gating uh, to move move them up, um, uh, and and sort of have them in the in the on deck circle, if you will, that that area just before the next cow goes on. Um, opening having a chute that uh, where the front opens up so they can see daylight, they're more likely to to, to go ahead and want to pass through. Um, uh, Minimize the noise. Obviously, there's going to be a fair bit of noise associated with with the uh, the trimming tool. Uh, but but then in the break in between when you're when you're uh, moving the next cow in, uh, try to minimize those noises. So so an example would be uh, if the gates on the trimming chute bang open and bang shut, maybe ask your trimmer or or on your own chute, you know, just put a little piece of uh, rubber somewhere in there at that at that bang point. Uh, to minimize the banging and clanging around, and that's going to get the animal less excited. Um, there's no one answer. This, this is probably going to be a more a, I'd, I'd like to come look at your situation, you know, if that seems to be a particular problem for you, and then maybe I can make more specific recommendations. So I apologize for being, those being a bit general, but, but they kind of have to be. Great. I guess um, we've got... One more here and, and welcome any others that need or that still have yet to come in, but um, beyond or, or in including some of the Merck Dairy Care resources, what um, what have you run into on farm or in, in your comings and goings of the best resources and materials, posters, um, trainings for employees um, to understand the importance of, of proper cattle marketing? and, um, you know, a lot of the, the topic areas that you touched on throughout here, um, the applied on farm aspects and then kind of those reminders, so the, the posters or, or additional follow-ups that you've seen work most effectively on farm. Yeah, so, so um, uh, honestly, the, the NMPF uh, farm, F-A-R-M, website has a pile of downloadable PDFs um, that that can can really really that that, that is the best resource that, that I've found at least um, uh, it, it, and I, I would point out some of the appendices I believe it's it's either appendix G or appendix H might be appendix H um, of the, the Farm 3.0 manual has much of what we talked about today all in one place. Um, it's uh, printable as a PDF. Uh, it's going to take, take a fair bit of ink because there, there's some dark space on there, but uh, it's a printable one pager that has most of what we talked about it today, and that would probably be the best resource, I would say. Um, but I would invite you, Emily. I see Jen Walker's on here. Sorry to call you out, Jen, but uh, perhaps you could type in if if you have any any resource resources to add to that, but the farm farm website is really really good. Thanks thanks for that shout out. We also um, to to your mention about the append appendices. We additionally have um, those posters, the top considerations for calling posters available uh, to order from the website. If anybody is interested in having those available for their dairies. Um, the final question, yeah, Dr. Mendelio. No, nope, go ahead. That, that, that was what I was referring to when I when I mentioned yep, okay. appendix G or appendix H. That, appendix. That's top considerations for coloring. That's yeah, that's, um, great. That's, that's a great resource. Excellent. Um, so our final question here, um, and it, I guess maybe it's kind of a broader question um, for for both you and us here at Farm. But from your, again, from your experience out in the field, do you get a sense that veterinarians understand 
what is required from their side of, of not only only this cattle marketing topic, um, but also you know the herd health plan and the cow care agreements to ensure that that all the dairy all of our dairies are are up to speed on version 3.0 requirements, but also more importantly, probably beyond even the farm program, that, that this is just the right thing to do on behalf of their cattle that you mentioned. And so I'll turn that to you, and then I'll also just kind of chime in on some of the things we've done on the farm side um, to, to work with the veterinarian community. Yeah, so I, I, I wish I could say that, uh, that, that all veterinarians out there were, were uh, um, up to date on, 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 on these, not only the, the specifics, but, but even these issues. Um, remember, there's a there's a wide range of veterinarians depending on your geographic region, uh, right? There 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 are some regions that are served still by traditional James Harriet type mixed animal practitioners who 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 you know do cows and and dogs and horses and cats and pigs and sheep and goats and and their you know dairy cows might not be their primary focus, uh, and so that not not to say that that veterinarian might not be an out Standing veterinarian, um, you know, for 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 the, the medicine and surgery needs of your cows, but but um, get, getting out into some of these areas might might not be something that they've kept up on. So so I, I don't want to be too negative, but uh, the answer is that, that 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 there's going to be a wide range, and it's just going to depend on your your individual veterinarian. Um, and, and and not to say that they that you shouldn't, you know, you know, perhaps if you if you ask them about it. And, and they do say no, then, then I would encourage you to work with them, offer the uh, an MPF farm website, uh, tell them that's a resource, and, and ask them to please um, work with you to, to help you to build your program. And, and, and then finally, I would just make a final note that remember that you, you, you should be cognizant of the time investment that they have in that. And, and be willing to to uh, reimburse them for that. Great, thanks. And I'll just add on to there. Um, last fall in September, Farm had a whole day long session at the Association for um, Bovine Practitioners meeting in Charlotte. We plan to uh, attend and participate again this year, um, and and identify, continue to identify more of those grassroots level opportunities to um, expand that knowledge base of our veterinarians. To Dr. Mendel's point, we've got, you know, there's a wide array um, and range of, of engagement from that community. And so I guess from, our, from the farm standpoint, um, we would welcome feedback and insight as to how to continue to engage with with our dairy veterinarians out there um, and, and make them aware of the resources and um, our requirements and how they can further help their dairy, their dairies. So I guess I'll, I'll put that out as a, as a challenge and maybe an action item for those of you on, on the webinar today and those who will uh, watch it later on that if you've got insight or thoughts, we'd welcome those recommendations. Um, you can contact us via email. It's probably the easiest at dairy farm at nmpf.org. So with that, that's our final question. Dr. Mendel, if you, do you have any parting comments before we wrap up here today? No, I just, I, I thank you all for your, for your interest. Um, you know, I fear a little bit that I was preaching to the choir, right? If it, the, the folks who were interested enough to tune into the webinar are the, or perhaps the folks that, that, that need this a bit less, um, the folks who, who, who need this a bit more are, or perhaps the ones less likely to have tuned in. Um, but having said that, uh, uh, I, I guess I meant that all as a as a compliment to, to the folks who did who do who did tune in. And you know, we all we all care about our cows uh, and doing the right thing for the cow. And not only because that's that's where we get our money from, but just because we like cows. At least I do. So take care and and, and have a good day. Great. Thank you all. Uh, just as a reminder, our next webinar will be next Thursday at the same time. Uh, it will be Dr. Kudse from Kansas State University speaking on pain management. So be sure to uh, plan to attend that as well and let all of your 
uh, contacts and peers know that that will be held uh, same time next week at 12 o'clock Eastern time on pain management. Thanks so much. Just an, again, final reminder here, the webinar series and uh, the recordings from past webinars, if you may have missed those, are available on our website at that link, the bit.ly uh, slash Merck webinars, or also if you go through the nationaldairyfarm.com website, um, go to participant resources and you'll be able to find that there. Additionally, the Dairy Care 365 resources, as Dr. Midla mentioned, are there on the website, easy to find. Um, just need a login and your access to all of those aspects are available to you. And one last part, uh, be sure to connect with us through our social media challenge, ch channels, not challenges, um, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Uh, most of them are either at Farm Program or on Facebook at National Dairy Farm Program. Thank you all and have a great rest of your week and we will hopefully see you back on next week at the same time. Thank you all.